So this talk is about startups, whether they're worth your time, whether they're worth your money or both. Look, the first thing to really uh, get clear on is that startups are a lot of fun. This is me sitting at a table with a bunch of startups at an INSEAD conference in Lisbon. And there's just this level of energy and excitement and fun around people who are busy pursuing their dreams, trying to make the world a better place in whatever way than th the way they see it. So really, if you think about just getting involved in a startups, however you do, it's very fun. It's very stimulating. You often end up working with people who are smarter or younger than you or both. Um, it is it's if you are someone who's got business experience already, it's a chance to use that knowledge, to use your contacts, to put them to good use. This is a brilliant thing to do when you are later in your career, even when you're sort of entering retirement is sort of busy wrapping up, um, wrapping up your career. It's a way to keep active relationships going through the rest of your life. Um, there's also a real joy around you sort of feel like you're making a difference by sharing your knowledge, but there's also, you aren't responsible to actually get it done. In your day job, you may very well have a lot of responsibility of you have these great ideas and you have to execute them. Here you can share your thoughts and great ideas and you walk away and someone else is responsible for making things happen. There's also some good sort of bragging rights from getting involved in startups. It gives you fun stories to share. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's just a lot of pluses of actually being involved with startups, whether it's through sharing your time with them or sharing your money. Let's talk now about what some of those different ways to get involved with startups are. Um, the first thing you could do is you can just give them time. And there's a couple of different ways to do that. You can just advise startups. You can be an advisor of whatever type, whatever uh, uh, a shape, whatever relationship. You can sit on a board. And by the way, don't overlook the fact that you can also do your own startup. If you find startups really want, uh, fun, you can start one yourself or you can join someone else's startup. I won't talk about that so much just to sort of flag it as um, we have startups in our port. There's a lot of people who think, oh, well, startups aren't for me. I'm I'm too this, I'm too that, I'm too old. We have portfolio companies. Uh, one of our portfolio companies was started by a founder in his 80s. Um, people who think, oh, it's not for me. We've got lots of people who never thought of themselves as a startup person who have found that business where they feel the best way they can make the business happen is through doing it themselves. So that's the first thing. We'll talk a little bit about each of those roles. The second thing you can do is you can get involved with startups as an angel investor. Now, an angel investor just means writing checks to startups yourself. There's there, there's no real definition of it. It's just someone who invests in an early stage private company. Um, you may end up providing some time. They might want to listen to you. They might want to get some advice for you. Um, there's some sort of things to be aware of there is that if you do get into the angel investing business, you'll be asked for money a lot. And some people are very comfortable being asked for money. And after a while, as tens of people do it, it can start to get a little bit tiring. Uh, so just be aware that that comes with the territory, both from people you haven't invested in who want you to invest in them and from people you've already invested in who will keep coming back for more and more money. Um, if you are looking at this as an investment um, uh, activity, being an angel, unless you want to do it at scale through hundreds of investments and very, very few people want to do that, it's very risky and it's very illiquid. And many angels make mistakes. They they fall into it not thinking about it and they learn of these factors afterwards. I know it's just, it was certainly something I ran into myself. So I'm very happy to share some of my experience there of what it really means to be an angel. And lastly, you can put money into startups through a VC. Now, this is a lot less fun. You get indirect fun, um, but you don't have the asks for money. I mean, you'll get occasional asks for money when the VC will ask you to sort of top up in what you're doing. Um, most VCs are still both risky and illiquid. To uh, Most VC funds are both highly risky and highly illiquid. Um, and I've got a little asterisk there. I mean, it's it's not risky if you want to diversify to hundreds of investments and there are VC funds or funds of funds who will do that for you. Um, and there are a few semi-liquid funds out there. Our fund does quarterly semi-liquidity. I'll give you one slide about our fund at the end um, just to give you a flavor there. But this is really great 
It's lots of fun, great use of your time. Be aware of what it means if you're going to put your money into it. So let's start by talking about advising startups. There are many, many opportunities out there, uh, ways to advise startups, and it's very easy to do. Um, one place to go if you want to say, hey, I'd like to meet some good startups and get started, is there are many accelerators out there. There's a number of schools have asso uh, uh, accelerators associated with them. Maybe you went to a study at a, a university or a college and there's a uh, accelerator of some sort attached to them. Um, the one thing to be aware of is there's all these people who will say, great, would love to have your experience to advise startups. Almost always that comes with no compensation. So this is volunteer. I've, as I mentioned, it's very fun. It's very gratifying. Um, so you get the psychic gratification, the fact that you're giving back and helping others. But it really isn't something which you should look at as a compensated thing, generally speaking. If you want to find accelerators or schools out there, there's lots of accelerators. You've got local engineering schools you can go to or your business school. Um, just you can Google accelerator programs. I've, I've done work with the Founder Institute in the past, for instance. Founder Institute gives you a lot of opportunities to advise if this is something you're doing. Now, you can also, rather than going through an accelerator program, a school, you can end up advising direct with a startup. If you're going to advise a startup directly, um, there are many, many advisor relationships started uh, and very few of them work out well. My first recommendation here is do with a startup exactly what you do with your, uh, with your love life, which is you typically want to date before you marry. You don't want to jump into a relationship with someone without getting a chance to try it out. So if some startup's interested in working with you, then just sort of say, hey, let's have a call. See how that call goes. And if they want, if you both want another call, have another call. After you've had a few calls and you see what it's like to work with a company, I would really recommend don't sign anything with a company till you've had at least three or four calls over a couple of month pro uh, period. And as you do that, you can decide at any point to wrap it up. But at that point, you can start to get involved. Uh, startups will typically compensate their advisors with equity. A good range to expect is somewhere between a tenth of a percent and one percent of the equity, depending how involved you are. If you do end up signing an agreement to be a, uh, a sort of a formal advisor for a startup, I really recommend that you set up a regular call schedule because entrepreneurs will have this desire to come to you for your help, et cetera. They're very busy people and they will end up buried in their day to day. And you'll be sitting there with equity in a company that never calls you. Um, you'll end up feeling you're not earning it. The company may end up presenting it. You don't want to get into the situation. So really just book a monthly call in no matter what. It can be a 10 minute check in. But you will often find that that's a point that that sort of discipline will make sure you have a very valuable interaction with the startup where you really earn, uh, sort of earn your keep. Um, startups may also have you join an advisory board. I'll talk about that separately in a section on boards. Um, look, we've at Loyal have looked at all these things. We have a number of people who work with us as advisors. Um, you can find on our website, you can just, there, there's a section there about, the, about joining us as advisors. You can take a look at. Um, one of the things we did, and we copied this from the Founder Institute. The Founder Institute is another place um, which shares equity with the advisors. So we saw that. We thought that was a wonderful model. So we've done it ourselves. You get in our case, we take 20% of our carry, the profit that we make off investing off of investing in companies, and we share that back with the advisors themselves. Now, be aware, in our case with our carry, in Founders Institute cases, very similar, they're sharing equity. Startups take a long time to give you money back again. So when you're looking at this, this is never something which is going to help pay your rent. This is something which if you do, if you build up equity in startups, however you get it, it's going to take you years to over a decade to get anything back out of this. And it's really something you do to help pay for your kid's education, to look after yourself in retirement, et cetera. In our case, every call we do is double opt-in and you're dealing with pre-trained startups, but I'll talk a little bit more about that 
next. Um, just some general tips if you're looking at advising startups. And this is one of our startups, a guy called, uh, the company's called Brew. They make a tea brewing machines in Switzerland. You can see a couple on the table there. And it's uh, a, a really wonderful little uh, invention. So look, if you're going to be advising startups, you move to an accelerator, you have a large risk of doing what we call adult babysitting, which is you are busy scheduling calls with startups and they have a call with you every couple of weeks and you're not really getting anything out of it. They're not necessarily getting anything out of it, but you're just the sort of check-in point. Have you done this? Oh, you haven't done this. Tell me more about what you're going to do to get it done, etc. So you end up in this sort of semi-management place. And it really, I mean, if you're someone, look, if you like managing people and, and volunteering for it, then do feel free to do so. But there's a real risk the way accelerators have set up where they're forcing you to meet. This is why we do our calls where everything is double opt-in because uh, my co-founder, Michael, and I have been parts of lots of accelerators and seen what things don't work well. Um, train startups are a lot easier to work with. It's a lot easier to work with, with someone when you can say, uh, when you can talk about what's the value of your inventory or what are your inventory turns or something, as opposed to someone who just says, oh, I just look at my cash, the cash in my bank account. That's all I look at. Now, some people have a lot of fun in helping uh, sort of startup founders who know nothing about what an, uh, a financial statement looks like. They may find that fun to work with, which is fine. If you want to do that, wonderful, go ahead. It, if you're someone who likes to go and get into higher level strategy, it's often easier to work with people who have sort of the basic grounding. In our case, we take alumni of INSEAD Business School, um, so they've got a basic grounding in business. And we also take top grads of the Founder Institute Accelerator, where they've had months of training from, from the advisors in the accelerator, uh, which makes them allows us to work with them at a different level. Um, if you are going to be advising startups, be very aware. You think you're there to give them your, your, your wisdom, your advice. What they really want is they want your Rolodex. They want you to introduce them to customers, to, to potential buyers, maybe to potential investors. But that is really what is at the back of their mind. Uh, so you shouldn't, shouldn't do this activity if you aren't willing to share your Rolodex. Having said that, don't feel obliged to share your Rolodex with startups um, in a indiscriminate way. Feel very free to sort of say, hey, as they as you get to know them, as you got to understand the business and be sure you won't be embarrassed by the introduction, feel free to then. So feel free to make them jump different hoops to make to to be worthy of the introductions you want to make. Just be aware that that is sort of the the hidden understanding that you will do. Um, you're almost always going to have a passive role um, when you're advising startups. And just think about what your time is worth. There's no way a startup can pay you enough to be worth to, to, to cover. And in most cases, they're unlikely to pay you enough to be worth your time. Now, there are a subset of advisors out there who are very comfortable to ask for very large amounts of equity, very high cash payments from startups, and they feel they deliver a lot of value. Um, so there, there is this subset, and I'll asterisk it, of people who do make money off the startups. There are many, many more advisors who understand what the startups are going through and try to get a balanced situation where you'll get some payoff if they do well, but you're not thinking of it as a way to make money. Um, there are a number of people who are naturally modest about their skills. Many often, you know, often I hear this from women particularly, and I get this question over and over, which is, oh, am I qualified enough to be a startup advisor? Well, take a look at your background. Sure, if you're a new grad from a new undergrad and you've been in the workforce for a year or so, probably not yet qualified, but if you've got a five or 10 year business career or longer, um, if you've been in a startup, if you haven't been in a startup, you are almost certainly, qual oh, I'll just say, if you've got five to 10 years of business experience behind you, you are qualified. You are qualified to advise startups on the things you know, the things you've experienced. And startups will often really appreciate the fact that you've got someone who's got seven years in banking uh, to tell them a little bit more about how things work in the bank. It really is valuable. So don't undervalue your experience. 
five to 10 years of business experience or more, you are qualified. If you've been in a startup of your own, I don't care what the startup was, you are qualified. Um, so do, do, do have that confidence. Let me talk a little bit more about this passive versus active role, because there's a number of advisors who come in and get disappointed um, as they're busy advising startups. Um, the first thing to keep in mind is that entrepreneurs are not your employees. You're advising them. You're not managing them. And really, as an advisor, you are working for them. Um, the odds are, and my experience is, and you'll get this all the time, they're going to ignore or actively do the opposite of something like 30 to 70% of what you advise. And this is actually a really good thing. Uh, people, uh, advi uh, entrepreneurs sometimes compla complain about this ping pong effect when they go into an accelerator and they've got 30 advisors and different advisors are advising them to do diametrically opposite things. If you're the entrepreneur, you should expect this. This is normal. Different people have different opinions. Um, there is just a, sort of one of the quotes I always remember to give myself some humility is Vinod Kosla was on stage at a TechCrunch conference, I guess, I think in 2013. And he was quoted as saying some percentage that's substantially larger than 95% of VCs add zero value and he would bet that 70 to 80% add negative value to a startup in their advising. And just always be really aware of that. The entrepreneur lives their business day in, day out. They know their customers. They know their product in a way you could never know it. So yes, you have some ideas. You have some, some advice from your experience. It's not necessarily the same. I mean, in my case, if... An entrepreneur takes my advice more than 70% of the time, I get scared <laughs> because I'm sure at least one of the things I advise them to do is wrong and it's going to hurt the business. And you should really just have this humility to say, I'm giving advice, but the person who has to live with the results, the person who has to live with everything is the entrepreneur themselves. And you are there to support them, not to manage them. And sometimes it's intensely frustrating because you give them advice and they ignore it and they go do it, the, the thing you advised against, and then they run into the problems which you told them they would run into. And that's okay. That is part of what's being an advisor. If you, if you can't handle that, then great. Join the company, become a team member, become an employee, um, and then you can sort of be busy to, to sort of take more of that responsibility. But otherwise, that's a big learning to take as you move from managing working in business to actually advise. Couple of quick thoughts here about sitting on boards. Um, I mentioned advisory boards early. Look, advisory boards aren't really boards. It's just, it's just another way to advise. Often you're asked to sit on an advisory board. They just want your name to look good on their website. Um, there's a wide variety of boards. Some of the advisory boards, there are some of them will meet regularly, some of them won't. Uh, some of the ones who re meet regularly will have interesting and useful discussions, many won't. Um, some will pretend they're boards, they're not boards. Um, so um, yeah, there, there's just this whole wide range. And if you're asked to be an advisory board, it doesn't really mean much, it's just eh, another way to be an advisor. Your name is up there, you might meet some of the other board members, you might have a couple of meals, whatever it is. So that's that's, totally fine thing, not much to worry about, as opposed to sitting on a board itself. Now I'll talk first about sitting on boards without cash compensation, um, because for most startups, cash is tight. You should not expect if you're used to public boards, et cetera, or you're paid for your board meetings, et cetera. For most startups, they won't do that. They will, however, and should compensate you with equity. However, just because you're being compensated with equity or even doing it on a volunteer basis, be aware that if you're on a board, you have legal obligations. And those legal obligations will change in whatever country you're at. But for instance, uh, if the company uh, doesn't pay the salary taxes on their employees, you may very well be legally responsible and personally responsible as a director to pay the unpaid taxes from your own pocket. Um, I actually got a phone call. I mean, there was a startup I was on. Um, where I ended up 
I, I was actually the, I was originally the CEO. Um, I ended up CEOs, by the way, have a, a very a high turnover because boards, if the company's in trouble, what do you do? You can't fire the team, you fire the CEO and you say, maybe a new CEO will turn it around. Anyway, so I left this, I left this company. Um, I still had significant shareholding. A year and a half later, I got a call from the um, a call from the uh, uh, Revenue Canada. Um, and I resigned from the board as I left and I gave them an official resignation letter. It's like, here, I'm off the board, et cetera. Well, they never transmitted that official resignation letter through to Revenue Canada. And a year and a half later, they had some unpaid taxes and I got the call from Revenue Canada. You're a director of this company. No, I'm not. <laughs> here is, here's the proof I'm not the director. And they went away, but they were coming after me because I had the because they were going to ask me to pay for the pay for then and, and by the way you can see it was important i had the resignation and the, the proper transmission i showed them the email and everything where i'd sent it um so just be aware of those legal obligations uh good companies and it's not that expensive get dno insurance directors and officers insurance which will help cover you against some of this so just be aware if you're on a board you're taking a legal position, be aware, and hopefully you'll be compensated for, for it by the equity you get. If you're in a startup board, startup boards are often mainly insiders. It's the founders and maybe one outside person, or it's the founders and the investors and maybe one outside person. As that outside person, you'll often end up training people on board work, training founders on what it means to work with a board. Um, so if you've never sat on a board before, great, you can get some experience here. Hopefully one of the other board members, if you're joining a board, really try to make sure there's at least one of the board members who has experience sitting on a board before, because you want that person on the board to be able to help you all understand what's going on, to, to be able to say, oh yeah, DNO insurance, here's some good providers or here's where and how. But someone who's gone through board programs, board training, it's really risky to be the first person on a board if you have no board experience yourself. And by the way, a great way to get board experience is to work with not-for-profits. Not-for-profits, there's tons of volunteer roles out there with not-for-profits. They love, I mean, they're always looking for volunteer board members and whatever your cause is, that's a great way to get experience. I have to say that for myself, there were a couple of not-for-profits. I mean, uh, not-for-profits like the INSEAD Alumni Association of Canada. <laughs> We created a board sitting on the board for that, really, and I had really great experienced co-board members who taught me, and I could see just from the way they ran things, because they've been on public boards, how they ran things. I learned a lot from osmosis, besides sitting in on a few board core, uh, sort of board uh, sort of seminars here and there. So there's 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 a lot you can do there to get learned. Um, look. People are uh, often interested in cash boards as a great way to supplement your income, et cetera. You don't really get that from startups. They're often professionally run uh, board programs. If you want to sit on like a formal board, it's worth doing a board program. And by the way, startups are a great start. I've had a number of people um, in, in my own experience, I had people who sat on my board in a startup who leveraged that into getting paid public board uh, seats afterwards because they could say, yeah, I've been on a not-for-profit board, but I've also been on a for-profit board before. I know how to do that. Um, look, angel investing may be something you want to do, or you maybe just want to get involved in supporting companies. The thing is, you don't have to invest if you advise, but you are going to be tempted to. And Look, you, you build a relationship with a company, you want to help the company, and then they're asking you for money. It's a lot like your kids. It's like, do you have some money? They say, okay, great. You want to introduce them to funders to help them solve the money problem. And the first thing you'll dis discover when you introduce them to people you know to invest is they're going to ask, have you invested? If you've invested, okay, great. Well, you think this is good. If you think it's good and you're introducing me, why have you not invested? What do you know that I don't? Um, you may be really excited by what they do and you want to support them. And there's always this temptation, oh, they just need another $20,000 and that, that will get them the inventory here, which will build their sales. And it's like they're working so hard for, oh, maybe I throw some of the money in myself. Um, it's very fun. It's very good for your ego. And you know, you can also, one of the things to be aware of is if you give companies money, um, they're more likely to listen to you. 
Now, I've warned you earlier that maybe that's a bad thing, that if they listen to you too much, but it's it's sort of one of the temptations you fall into. If you're the person giving the money, just like their boss, their manager, allocating budget, well, then that's the structure in corporations is the person, your boss gives you the money and they get power over how that money is spent. Um, if you're going to get involved in this, really... Uh, and I'm speaking now to people who are not startup people, people who come from the corporate world, just be very aware that startup math isn't what you're used to. If you work in an established company, and by the way, this math here is for the private equity um, industry, you will see that returns generally follow a normal distribution, where more than half the times you make a decent return on your money. In very rare times, you struggle. Only 8% of companies will fail. Um, and modest success, hitting budget, you have a budget where you're going to double over a few years, is the sort of thing which you're targeting. And that is the most likely outcome. So this is what we're used to in a corporate world. I was in management consulting with Bain and Company. And you set your yearly budget and the yearly budget is a 10% lift from the prior year, et cetera. And you're used to operating in this environment. This is what the environment actually looks like when you are an angel investing. Half your investments will fail completely. You won't get a penny back as opposed to 8% failing earlier in, in the sort of normal world you're used to. And yeah, you make double, a bit more than double your money back again from the companies where you, which sort of did well. That's great because you double your money normally in the in the environment you're used to. But here, because half your companies failed, when you double your money, all you're doing is covering your losses <laughs> and you end up back where you started. Now, the big difference here is that you make half your returns from 4% of your investments because that's the nice thing about a startup is you can invest in a Google at a hundred million dollar valuation, you can invest in whatever name your startup at a five million dollar valuation and they sell for 50 million and you can make 10 times your money or more. Half your return that only happens to you four percent, one in 25 investments, but that's where half your returns come from and that's what makes all the difference. Um, so if you think about this and we want to talk for a second right now about angel investing and managing your money, you can see it's intensely risky because half your money is coming from one in 25 deals. Now you can you can go out and say, well, I'm going to be the person who I don't, it isn't one in 25 deals which are home runs for me. It'll be one in one in two deals. Um, but guess what? Every angel investor thinks that. Every VC thinks that. They're all thinking that that's what they can do. And the end result, and by the way, I entered this business as an angel investor. Um, I was top of my class mm -hmm. in Seattle. I was at Bain and Company. Mm -hmm. uh, I made money in my first startup. And I started angel investing going, you know, um, I'm different. I'm better. I know the industry stats. That won't apply to me. And I was exactly industry stat results at exactly the outcomes you would expect to, to get. So just, uh, I learned that humility. So be very aware, one in 25 investments is where you make your money. And if you wanna talk about good investment theory for a moment, which is you need to diversify for investing in stocks, you need at least 20 stocks. If you want to get at least 20 outliers, 20 times 25, you need 500 investments. And by the way, there's this US venture capital group called 500 Startups, started with exactly that premise, which is if you are below 100 investments, angel investing is an intensely risky activity. You might get lucky, you could lose all your money. Well, you could lose, if you make 100 investments, you won't lose all your money, but you could lose a lot of your money. If you make 10 investments, you could lose pretty much all your money. Um, uh, so if you're going to be doing this, just be aware it's an outliers business and either you're having fun, it's gambling money. And you know, with gambling that when you go to the casino on average, you're going to walk away losing, but sometimes you're going to walk away winning. Um, and you just sort of go with money you can afford to lose or keep in mind, 
500, 500 startups and think about how do you get hundreds of investments. The other thing which people don't think about with angel investing when they do it is it is a very illiquid activity. Your money is locked away until the company gives it back and the company gives it back on an exit. Now, there's different stats out there. It's uh, The IPO market is maybe starting to open up again, but it is generally seven years to get half of M&A deals to happen, nine years to get half of IPOs. I mean, my personal experience, my top angel deal, I got 30 times my money back. By the way, the one, the only one exit, which was more than a 3x exit out of the 10 investments I made. Um, and I was lucky. It was one in 10, so it was 10%. But I had one. So I, I mean, I consider that luck when it should be one in 25. But it took me 14 years to exit that company. And if I tried to exit it after eight or 10 years, I might have got ah, four or five times my money back. It was the patience to wait until the company had a good acquirer who would pay a good price, which is what got me 30 times. And that was 14 years. I made that investment when I was in my 30s. That was fine. I'm in my 50s right now. I really don't like illiquid investing where I can't touch the deal for 14, touch the money for 14 years. And just be very, very aware. I meet angel after angel who starts writing checks, writing checks, writing checks. And then they go, oh my goodness, all this money is locked up. I can never touch it. I might get something back, but even the successful ones, I don't. And by the way, it's a fairly long time to fail. So it'll take you three years to see half your failures, six years to see 90% of your failures. But you'll make, write all these checks. You'll see all these companies fail over the years. And then gradually at the end, a few of them will come back. Now, of course, I'm talking about it's completely illiquid. I mean, you say, well, isn't there isn't there a market? You know, there's... If you can find a buyer and you can maybe find a buyer when a company is doing a follow on round, they always get worried when someone's selling out of the company. It's like, what do you know that I don't know in a private company? Um, there's a standard liquidity premium of 20 to 30 percent. So you'll give up at least 20, 30 percent of your um, of your value if you can find a buyer. But it is a very illiquid market where it's very, very hard to buy, find a buyer. So you should generally count on you make an angel investment. That money is gone. So look, if you're angel investing, you will start thinking of venture capital. And I've talked about how fun it is to be directly involved with a startup. And if you're an angel investor, you're directly involved with a startup and you get all the fun there. You still get some fun when you do venture investing. You can be supporting causes. You've still got vicarious bragging rights. The VCs will often arrange times for you to meet the different entrepreneurs. You still get some of that fun. You maybe get direct deal flow if you're thinking of investing. But if you think about it as an investing activity, so yeah, sure, it's a source of angel deal flow if you want to be an angel, but it's much easier to hit this 500 startups um, because when you invest in startups individually, you have to do 500 of those checks. Whereas a VC fund might have 15 or 20 investments it makes, so you can invest in 25 funds, 20 at a time, and then boom, it's much easier to make 20, 25 investments to get to 500 than it is to make 500 investments to get to 500. Now, be aware the typical minimum is a half million. Well, typically a VC will tell you their minimum is, is 500,000. Um, often then they'll say, oh, but we really want you in, so we'll give you a break, we'll take a little bit less. Typical minimum you can negotiate them down to is somewhere between 100 or 250,000, depending on the fund. Um, do keep in mind with venture capital, you are still illiquid. Your money is locked away for 10 years and you have these things called capital calls where the, the fund keeps its money. I'll show you a slide next on sort of how venture capital timelines work. Um, now, why on earth do people take the liquidity? Why do people invest in venture funds? Well, look, you're balancing three risks. Your first risk, of course, and when you invest, just generally, your first risk, of course, is investment losses. So you want a low risk investment because you don't want to lose your money. And you also have a risk of unexpected cash needs. So you want liquidity. So why do people put money into a high risk, illiquid venture fund or high risk, illiquid startup investments? It's because you've got another risk, which not everyone thinks of, which is your risk of outliving your assets. You want good returns so that your assets grow enough 
to give you a healthy retirement. So you really need to think about returns as well and what you're doing. Um, this is just to lift the cover a little bit on VC funds. And this is how most VC funds work because most VC funds are closed-ended funds. 99% of VC funds think like this. And they really sit on this timeline, which is they're going to start off fundraising. They have no money. And they're pitching, 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 raising money, raising money. They then enter an investing period, which starts with sort of a zero to two year period when they won't be asking you for money, but they do have these capital calls, which is they take some of the money, they deploy it, they come back to you, they ask for more capital. And by the way, if you don't give them the added capital, often your initial investment is partially, if not fully, forfeit. Um, so they really have terms which strongly, strongly push you to keep writing checks to them. Um, once those capital calls, those capital calls will typically happen over a three-ish year period. But the thing that happens in the first two years, they're just saying, give me more money to invest, give me more money to invest. But in the next two years, the VC fund is raising their next fund. So initially, you write them the check, they're happy, they take the money, they invest it. But after those two years, they're going to start coming back to you to ask for more money because they're raising their next fund. At the end of four years, they're fully deployed. And then it's about managing to exit. They want to raise their next fund. If they can't raise their next fund, you might have a bit of a stranded portfolio, less support for the companies, et cetera. And then ultimately, the nice thing about a venture fund is it's got a fixed lifeline uh, lifetime of eight or 10 years, but it'll see a plus two, plus two. So they can extend it by a few years. And what they'll do is they'll sell off the basket of assets at a discount. And there's lots of secondary funds out there who've sprung up in the past few years because they've realized a great way to make money is just get a big discount on a venture fund because they're forced to close, <laughs> take that discount. And of course, that re reduces your returns by the 20, 30%, but they want to take that discount and then they'll hold the portfolio and make money off of it. Um, look, VCs standard fees are two and twenty. If anyone asks you different than a two and twenty, just be aware that is non-industry standard. Um, the venture, the VC is living on the two percent of managed money. You want to know how big the fund is. That'll show you how well they're being paid. If the company is raising a billion dollars, hopefully they can they can live on less than two percent, although they may ask for it. Do be aware they want two percent of your committed capital even if you haven't given it to them, you haven't called it yet, but they, they'll want 2% of the uh, million dollars you've promised, not 2% of the 200,000 you've always already given them. We think that's pretty crazy. We just charge 2% of whatever people have given us, but this is it. And then they'll want 20% of whatever profits they make you as, a, as, a, as an add-on. Um, I did promise one slide on loyal. And look, uh, I told you at the beginning that venture capital is an illiquid, risky asset class. And I just want to simply say it doesn't have to be. Uh, we have a fund which has quarterly semi-liquidity. Um, we set a price every quarter. You can buy or sell at that price. Um, the, the longest anyone's had to wait to get money out of this has been two quarters so far. They got partial fill the first quarter. The rest filled the second quarter. It could take you as long as a year to get out. But I mean, I can tell you as, as an angel investor, if you told me I could sell my holdings and get out in a year or a few quarters, I would have been delighted. And that is really why we built the fund we did. We've got good returns, uh, but we have a lot more price stability. You can see here where the green line in terms of returns, the gold line is the our, the Cambridge Associates uh um, institutional grade venture capital. These are the top VC funds that they think that institutions should invest in. And you can see we've had exactly the same returns um, with a lot less of the roller coaster ride, which you can see either in other venture capital or in the stock market. We just do a pretty good job. We're massively diversified. We have an unusual investing process to preserve capital. So yeah, that's a, a little bit about us. Um, and yeah. I, I talked about different ways to get involved with startups. How do you get, it is really fun. So you can get involved with startups by giving your time as an advisor, sitting on a board, doing your own. You can be an angel and give money and possibly time, or you can invest in VCs, still get some of the fund, but this is much more about how do you get startups making money for you in your portfolio rather than having direct fund from them yourself. Let me stop there and be happy to take any questions anybody has about uh, working with startups, getting involved, advising, investing.
So we have a question here, which Casa is coming. Uh, it, it was submitted. The question is, what are some benchmarks of a diversified portfolio? Well, look, the rules of diversification in investing are well known. And for some reason, people sort of, we all know, I mean, those of us who are educated in finance or banking or investing all know the rules. And for some reason, everyone takes all these rules and we we know what the rules are, but we pretend they don't apply when we're investing in startups, when we're doing angel investing, et cetera, or venture investing, because a diversified portfolio, well, a diversified portfolio is global. It isn't just in the one country. It is across sectors. You don't want to have your returns rise or fall based on one sector. And yet what are all venture funds, almost all venture funds are specialized by region, by sector. So you're throwing away diversification. So what's good diversification? It is diversification by sector, by region, and by number of investments. And as, I mean, a diversified portfolio of public companies is 20, 30, some people say 50. Um, a diversified portfolio of uh, startups is more like 500. I mean, some people make the argument for 200, 300. Um, but yeah, that's that's really what the, the the result is. And what do you see as the results is you see much more predictable returns. You see returns where um, a diversified portfolio in a good year may have a 20% return and in a bad year will lose 10%. And a non-diversified portfolio in a good year, you might triple your money and in a bad year, you might lose 80%. In fact, you could lose all depending on how poorly diversified your portfolio is. Um, so yeah, diversification in finance works the same way. Um, another question here is what is the best way to start as a newbie? Um, the best way to start as a newbie advisor is just jump in and do it. You're just giving your time. Get out, find a startup, go to an accelerator program, go to a local university, volunteer. Just say, say, hey, I'd like to advise some startups, any good startups I can meet and chat with and get out there and do it. So it's really easy to do that. And there's very little downside to advising um, startups to just learn a little bit more about them and how they work. I mean, I know, I know one... Uh, one executive here in Toronto who retired, who basically went out and he said that this was how he was going to keep himself active after retirement. He went out, got involved with a couple of different accelerators, put out a little newsletter every month with his learning, how the accelerators were, what he learned through talking to startups. And it's great way. I mean, you get experience advising uh, like anything else just by doing it. Um, getting experience as an investor, sort of an angel investor, is a whole other topic because it isn't costless to play around with the investing unless you have, I mean, if your net worth is $100 million or more, to take uh, sort of take a few thousand dollars or even tens of thousand dollars and play around with it doesn't matter to you. But the challenge is most startups will take won't take any less than five or ten thousand dollars and they'll be pushing to put tens of thousands in and you can do the math and say if it's ten thousand in investment and i need to make hundreds of investments well ten thousand investment times a couple hundred investments that's a few million dollars and for most of us a few million dollars isn't play money that's real money um so to start as an investor um couple of things. One thing to do is you can certainly join in a local angel group, but you're still going to really be pushed to put in thousands, tens of thousands, sort of, yeah, ten ten thousand dollars or more per investment. At least there you'll have other experienced people who you can talk to. Um, although not everybody thinks about it mathematically for returns, many have a lot of personal biases about, oh, I'm special, I'm better, I'm this, I'm that. And like I said, I started off with those <laughs> those biases. I'm special, I'm different, I'm better. And uh, didn't didn't actually uh, learn the humility with that. Um, the other way to start as an investor is to um, to invest in a couple of venture funds because again you can do that and see. If, uh, I mean, our minimum investment, for instance, is hundred thousand um, dollars, and you can you can see what the different funds are, what their minimum is. But rather than having to put millions into multiple uh, multiple deals, you can put money into one venture fund and then. As part of putting money to the venture funds, say, I'm looking for deal flow, I'm looking for co-investment, and then you can invest directly in a couple of those companies 
pre-screen supported by the venture fund. So you, you should be reducing your risk a bit there because you've got um, you've got someone else who's looked over the shoulder of the company and there may be, and that might be a way to start write a few other checks. Um, but fundamentally, yeah, it's easy to get started advising. It's easy to get started angel investing. Lots of people will take your money, but it can be an expensive learning process. Good. Um, those are the, the, the pre-submitted questions Cass had. Does anyone else have any other questions? You can feel free to take yourself off mute, turn on your camera and just tell, uh, state your question if you have it. I do notice also we've got a couple of entrepreneurs on the call here. If any of the entrepreneurs wants to unmute and share their experience of working with advisors and any advice for what works well when working with advisors, who are the best advisors you've had? What are the things which you've seen good advisors do well? Yes, Philippe. Morning, everyone. Hi, Cameron. So I'm a, I'm a newbie here. I'm an advisor with Loyal. So I had a few conversations with some company. And I also started as an angel investor quite recently. So the first words that I have is thank you for being very candid, very honest. All what you described is exactly what I went through. I've put my money. It's very clear that we'll probably never see it again. That's okay. I have bragging rights. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, 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 and um, I'm very aware of the risk. And surprisingly enough, they do matter more than what I initially thought. But... As you said, it's important to start somewhere. I'm advising this company. I, I have invested in them because I think they have a great product and potential, but maybe they will just disappear off the surface of Vancouver very soon. Who knows? Now, the, the question for me is, what is the next step? And how do I do more? And now I need to figure out, and that's why I'm here today, whether I want to invest as an angel in the second company where I think potentially I can add value or maybe they will listen to me or not. Or if I go via, via a fund, which will have less bragging rights, but probably will be safer. So that's where I am. That's why I'm here today. But I really liked what you, the picture you've painted. Yeah. And look, a lot of that is it comes down to that money you're investing. What are you hoping? Um, is it play money for you? It, the, the additional money you want to put in, is this like going to Vegas where you're just having fun with the money or is it you're investing? Because remember, if you want the engagement with the company, you don't have to give the money to get engaged. You can be an advisor. You can actually start to actively work with them and they may even give you equity for free in the company or you might get outsized amounts of equity because you put a little bit in, but you want to also have a contract with them. And I've seen some advisors do that. So if you just want the company involvement, you can do it through advising, possibly using an investment to catalyze an advising role. Um, if it's money which you want to invest, then you want to start, if it's, this is money to help give me a better retirement, then honestly, two, three, four, five. Look, I've I've met two groups of angel investors. I met the angel investors, and I suppose I fall into the first category of angel investors who've had some luck, who've had some success. And I still think this is a great asset class because I did have that one 30 times my investment back out of 10 investments. And all of a sudden I tripled my money. And I think I, I feel really good about this. This is this is a really good. I think this is a good activity to be in. And I've similarly met, I met one of the top angel investors uh, in Toronto. He was the uh, probably the top angel investor in Toronto in the, uh, in the 90s and 2000s who um, stopped angel investing altogether because he said, I've invested in like 30 companies and I've lost money. And this is a stupid asset class. And I would advise anyone against ever doing angel investing. It's just a great way to lose money. And honestly, I think there's a lot of luck in that. If you want to take the luck out, you do follow good investing rules, diversified underlying, 
buy and I would start looking. I mean, as I said, there's funds like us where you can invest in hundreds of underlying companies in one check. There's also fund of funds, which will invest in tens of underlying venture funds. I mean, you have slightly higher fee level, you pay a 3% rather than a 2%. But um, if you're thinking about this as an asset class in your portfolio, um, then you you want to think about how do you get the diversification because that's what preserves your money. Yeah, no, no, that's that's quite clear. And uh, going the directly involvement advising company, it's actually a lot of work. It so is. You need to you need to hit your sweet spot where you you think you can add value. So don't advise someone on something you don't know. That's useless. But and they will not listen to you. But it's a lot of work. And it's a lot of failed attempt and uh, you start by drinking a lot of coffee, meeting a lot of people, then you go and visit their place and then if they have a little, I don't know, factory sometimes or yeah. depending on their business, but it's a, it's a lot of effort. But that's also where the fund comes from. So that's precisely it. That is the fund. And look, there are... Um, uh, when I started my angel investing and people often, so I think it's actually confusing to combine together the advising and the money, because if you think about the value of the time you spend advising the startup you've put money into, and you count up what the hourly value of your time is, you it's so easy to invest $10,000 in a startup and also throw another $5,000 worth of time into them. Um, and it just really becomes inefficient. And you could put the same amount of time into something else and be paid much more for it. So, I mean, it's one of the reasons why I was more of a passive investor. There's more active angel investors like yourself who want to get involved in the companies. And I always just did the math and said, I mean, okay, I've got 10,000 in the company. Why is it worth my giving more than 10 hours a year to the company? Because it's just like, <laughs> where's my ROI on that extra time? Yeah, okay. But there's a learning curve. And if you're... Of course. If you're well, look, it, it, it's fun. And, and like I say, it's fun. So if you think about it as a fun thing to do and you enjoy doing it because you're giving back, you're contributing, et cetera, then by all means do it. Just don't do the math. <laughs> I'm too rational of a person. I did the math and it's like, uh, but don't do the math. And just look, I mean, honestly, if you, if you, if you told me tomorrow I, I had my time free and I, I had all the money in the world and I could spend my time doing anything I want, then would I go out and spend time with, with startups and advice? Absolutely, I would, because that's just such a great way to contribute. So I would, I would do that. If I didn't need to think about money, I would absolutely do it just for fun. And I think that's the right way to think about it is as a fun activity, it's fun. You don't have to write checks. You can write checks. And yeah, sometimes, as I said, sometimes it, it is good to do a little bit of combining of the two where you writing a check catalyzes an advising position. But if you're going to do that date before you marry, make sure you really get along with the entrepreneur first. Very good advice. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. All right, let's wrap things up there then. Thanks every, everyone for joining me. The, the video will be available and put out for those who, who, who want to follow up with this afterwards. But I hope this has helped inspire you to get involved in startups and uh, made it a little easier for you so you will have fewer hurdles or fewer expensive learnings you run into along the way. Thanks very much.